Our um, seventh and final speaker is um, Jacob Rooney. He is a postdoc and a new postdoc at the Simon Center, um, and he got his PhD at UCLA in 2018. Um, his title is an overview of embedded contact homology. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you for letting me give a talk here. Uh, okay, so yeah, so as the title says, I'm just going to give an overview of embedded contact homology, um, what it is, and uh, maybe an application, and uh, maybe time permitting a little bit about uh, what I've been doing. All right, so we'll start, we'll start with uh, kind of an origin story. So in the early 1990s, um, people studied the cyber witten invariants and got for smooth four manifolds and got a bunch of really great results out of it. Um, so for an example, if you consider the K3 surface, which is the zero locus of this degree four polynomial in CP3, and you connect some it with CP2 bar, which is CP2 with reversed orientation, um, then that's homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic to the manifold you get by connect summing three CP2s and 20 CP2 bars. Okay, so this is a, an interesting example of things that you can do with cyber Um I think this result, this example was originally actually due to Donaldson and proved using his invariance, but you can also do it with sub theory. And then in the mid 90s, uh, Cliff Taubes proved a result relating these cyber witten invariants of smooth, smooth four manifolds in the case when the manifold's symplectic to counts of what are called J-holomorphic curves, um, which I'll explain in a little bit. And so embedded contact homology uh, was developed by Michael Hutchings at Berkeley as a symplectic analog of three-dimensional cyber witten theory, uh, cyber witten fluor cohomology, uh, kind of along the lines of Tobbs's result on symplectic four manifolds and uh, cyber witten invariance with J-holomorphic curves. Okay, so let's set the stage a little bit. Uh, so a symplectic manifold is a smooth, even-dimensional manifold together with a closed two-form whose top exterior power is a volume form. Okay. Right. And then these geohomorphic curves rely on a choice of almost complex structure, uh, which is just something that looks like multiplication by i. So it's the endomorphism of the tangent bundle that squares to minus the identity. Uh, the, the difference is that we don't require that this be integrable, meaning we don't, re this, uh, this j will give the tangent bundle is the structure of a complex bundle, but not necessarily a holomorphic vector bundle, which is okay. We can, we can live with that. And then what is a J holomorphic curve? Well, it's a smooth map from a Riemann surface into your manifold, uh, whose differential intertwines the complex structure on the Riemann surface with the almost complex structure on the target. Okay. So you can think of it as being holomorphic for this choice of almost complex structure on X. Uh, so these symplectic manifolds are not really the object of discussion of this talk, but they play a role. Uh, the natural setting that we'll be working in is an odd dimensional cousin of symplectic manifolds called contact manifold. So a contact manifold is an odd dimensional manifold together with a hyperplane distribution that satisfies a property called nowhere integrability, meaning you can never find a hypersurface in Y that's everywhere tangent to this uh, hyperplane field. And uh, ECH is defined in dimension three, so we'll stick to that. Uh, and we'll always assume that this two-plane distribution is the kernel of a global one form on Y. And if you reformulate it as, as such, the knower integrability condition translates into uh, lambda wedge D lambda uh, being non-vanishing everywhere. Uh, all right. All right. So, everybody's first example of a contact manifold. Uh, you take R3, you take your lambda, your contact form, to be dz minus y dx, and then you can easily compute that if you take lambda which d lambda, you get the standard Euclidean volume form, and so this is a contact manifold. Right. And I think every talk about contact manifolds is contractually obligated to have the following picture in it. Uh, so this is what the two-plane distribution on R3 with this contact form looks like. So as you go from y equals minus infinity to plus infinity, 
these planes twist by an angle pi. Uh, and then it's invariant in the x and z directions. Um, how are these two things related? I said they were cousins. So these contact manifolds appear as special hypersurfaces in symplectic manifolds. Uh, what special means is not particularly relevant for this talk. Um, but we can realize any contact manifold as such a hypersurface by considering its symplectization. So we take a product with a real line, and we take the contact form lambda and make a symplectic form on R cross Y by taking d of e to the s times lambda. And s is the coordinate of the r factor. And then we can get back to our original contact manifold by looking at the slice of the symplectization at s equals 0. Okay. So this is uh, one way that symplectic manifolds and contact manifolds are related to each other. So uh, we've kind of set the stage, and now we'll introduce the principal actors. Uh, so if we have a contact manifold with contact form lambda, the contact form gives us a special vector field on Y, uh, which is called the Rabe vector field. And it's defined by these two equations. Uh, the first one just tells you that uh, the Rabe vector field is a section of a certain real line bundle on Y. And the second one normalizes your choice of section. Uh, to make it unique. Right. And uh, we care about closed periodic orbits of this vector field, which we call Rabe orbits. Right. So. Right. so let's look at a few examples. Um, oh, before this. Yeah. So if we impose a certain non-degeneracy condition on lambda, um, which I won't get into, it's not particularly important what it is. Uh, then these orbits come in two types. They're elliptic and hyperbolic, depending on kind of what the behavior of the flow of this vector field is around the closed orbit. Uh, this distinction is not particularly important for this talk, except at one point when it is. Uh, all right, so let's look at three examples. Uh, we'll go back to R3, and it's just everyone's first example of a contact manifold. And so the rate vector field is just DDZ. And the, there are no closed rabe orbits. All the trajectories just are vertical lines in the z direction. All right, so now what if we move to S3 instead? Uh, so we I'll take S3 with this given contact form. And it turns out that the rabe vector field is actually tangent to the fibers of the hop map to the two sphere. So in this case, we get a contact manifold where the rabe vector fields, uh, the trajectories foliate the entire manifold. So every point lies on a, a closed orbit. But this situation can change fairly dramatically if you perturb it slightly. So if we perturb this sphere to an ellipsoid, what happens? Uh, so if we take this given ellipsoid and we ensure that A over B is irrational, uh, with the same lambda as before, then all of these uh, rabe orbits collapse, and we actually only have two closed orbits of this vector field, which will be the intersections with the complex uh, coordinate hyperplane. So you take your nice S3 example, you perturb it a little bit, and all of a sudden, you go from infinitely many closed orbits to only two. Uh, and there's a famous conjecture on the existence of these Rabe orbits uh, due to Alan Weinstein, uh, which he conjectured every closed contact manifold has a Rabe orbit. Right? And this has been a subject of a lot of work in contact topology uh, for many years. And in uh, 2000s, uh, Cliff Tobbs actually proved this in dimension three, an amazing result, um, that every closed contact manifold has a Rabe orbit, has a closed orbit of this Rabe vector field. And um, this conjecture and uh, related questions also motivated a lot of study with embedded contact homology. How many closed orbits can you prove exist on a given three manifold, and so on. All right, so 
now that we've set the stage, you know the setting, we know principal actors. So let's define, let's actually say what embedded contact homology is. So we'll define a chain complex. So the groups are generated over the mod 2z, but what are called orbit sets. So you take distinct embedded RABE orbits uh, with positive multiplicities. And you think of the multiplicities as going around an embedded orbit uh, the n times. And there's a restriction that we put on these generators. If you have a hyperbolic orbit, multiplicity has to be one. So if you've never seen embedded contact homology before, this is probably fairly mysterious. Um, and if you have seen embedded contact homology before, it may still be a little bit mysterious. Um, but what I'll say, if people are wondering, is that you use this when proving that d squared equals zero. Okay. Uh, and to relate this to uh, Selvig Witten theory and also to Hagard Fleur homology, uh, there's no requirement that these orbit sets be non empty. The, orbit set, the empty orbit set is a valid generator. Uh, it's always a cycle, and it, the homology class corresponds to what's called the contact class in Hagard Fleur homology and Selvig Witten Fleur cohomology. What about the differential? So to define the differential, you choose an almost complex structure on the symplectization. Um, this, this almost complex structure has to satisfy certain properties, but the one that's relevant for us today is that it has to be R invariant. So if you move in the R direction of R cross Y, J doesn't change. Right. And the differential counts what are called punctured J holomorphic curves, which is best explained uh, with a picture. So we have a smooth map, U, from a Riemann surface with finitely many points removed into the symplectization. And the punctures are divided into positive punctures, which I've colored in red, and negative punctures, which I've colored in blue. So as you go into a positive puncture, the R coordinate in the target goes to plus infinity. And in the Y factor, you converge to one of these closed orbits of the Rabe vector field. Okay. And similarly, for a negative puncture. And, uh, and then the differential of U intertwines the complex structure on the domain and the almost complex structure J on the target. Right. And uh, these Riemann surfaces can have genus, that's fine. No, no a priori restriction on what the genus has to be. Yeah. Okay, so you don't just count any of these curves. Uh, so which curves you count depend on something called the ECH index. And the only thing that's important for us to know today is that if you have low index, which in this talk means either one or two, uh, then this is equal to the dimension of the moduli space of these maps uh, containing you. So these maps live in uh, finite dimensional families uh, for the ones we consider, ones we count. And the differential is actually going to count maps with index one. So curves that live in families with one degree of freedom. So now you can stop and think, what is that degree of freedom? Well, because I said that this almost complex structure has to be invariant in the R direction, you can take one of these curves and translate it up and down in the R direction of R cross Y, and it's still J holomorphic. So if you have a curve that lives in a one-dimensional family, that one degree of freedom is just translation in the R direction. And so if you quotient out by that action, you'll get something that's at least discrete. All right, so then define the differential as of alpha, an orbit set alpha, as a sum over orbit sets theta, where the coefficients uh, are mod two counts of J holomorphic curves that are asymptotic to the orbit set alpha at the positive ends and to the orbit set beta at the negative ends. After you mod out by this R translation to get something discrete. All right. And there are two questions that you ask yourself when you look at this definition. First one is you have a big sum over beta. Okay, is this a finite sum? And the second is you have a, the coefficients are these counts of points, 
count of a discrete set uh, is that a finite count of curves? And so the answer is, uh, well, yes, you can make them both finite. So you can perturb the contact form to make the sum over beta finite, and you can perturb the almost complex structure uh, to make the count of curves finite for every beta. Okay. So uh, to relate this a little bit more to cyborg witten floor cohomology and hagard floor homology, if you've seen those, um, those two theories have what's called a U map, and ECH does as well. So uh, for this map, you actually count index two curves. So this is still what's considered a low index curve. So these live in uh, two dimensional families. And you count curves that pass through a specified point in your three manifold or, and, uh, and in the symplectization. All right, so let's look at, uh, so first, are there any questions so far? So let's look at an application. Um, so Hobbs proves that this embedded contact homology is isomorphic to the uh, cyber witten fleur cohomology in dimension three. Um, and actually, you can give another proof of the Weinstein conjecture using this isomorphism. Uh, so that there's a result of Kronheimer and Ravka that says that the cyber witten fleur cohomology is always infinitely generated. And so if you know that that's then isomorphic to embedded contact homology, you can always find a generator that gives you an embedded uh, rave orbit. So that can actually uh, be used to prove the Weinstein conjecture in dimension three. And it's kind of a further development of the theorem of Tobbs that I uh, mentioned earlier, where he proved the conjecture in dimension three. But you can actually do better. Uh, if you ask the question, how many rave orbits do there have to be on a given contact manifold? Uh, so in 2012, uh, Dan Christopher Gardner and Michael Hutchings proved that every contact form is on a closed three manifold has at least two embedded rave orbits. This is the minimum number. Uh, we saw an example of that earlier with the ellipsoid where it had exactly two. And you can do even better. Uh, so more recently, Gardner, Hutchings, and Palmer Leano proved that if, you are, if your three manifold is not a sphere or a lens space, and you have a certain kind of contact form, uh, then you actually have infinitely many distinct embedded rate orbits. Okay. So are there any questions? I'm almost out of time, so should I keep going or should I just uh, stop here? How much longer would you want to keep going? Um, it would be a, a couple of minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, I suppose so. Oh, okay. All right. So then what am I interested in? Well, if you, in the other related theories, embedded, uh, Hagar floor homology and Sauber Gwitten floor cohomology. If you have a cobordism between two three manifolds, then you actually get a chain map between the chain complexes for those, those manifolds. And one goal of embedded contact homology is to kind of define these in this setting, these chain maps, in, uh, intrinsically. So, what does that mean? The kind of cobordism that I'm going to be considering is an exact symplectic cobordism. So you have a symplectic four manifold whose boundary, positive boundary is some contact manifold, negative boundary is some other contact manifold um, with an appropriate primitive that restricts the contact forms on those two boundary pieces. All right. And given one of these cobordisms, you want to count a chain, uh, you want to define a chain map uh, from the positive boundary to the negative boundary chain complexes. And so Hutchings and Cliff Tobbs actually define maps, uh, such maps, via the isomorphism that Tobbs proved with Cyber Witten fleur cohomology. 
but uh, one of the big questions in ECH was, um, can you define these chain maps by counting holomorphic curves? All the other, like the differential is a count of holomorphic curves, the U map is a count of holomorphic curves. So these chain maps should be counts of holomorphic curves as well. So the question is, how do you define them? All right. So one idea you can try is to uh, define the chain map as a count of index zero curves in what's called a completion of the symplectic cobordism. So a neighborhood of the positive boundary kind of looks like a symplectization. You can glue half a symplectization onto it. Oh, it shouldn't be R cross Y yet. Yeah, it should be only half of the symplectization. And you can do the same thing with the negative boundary. And so now you have something that uh, you can, into which you can map punctured holomorphic curves. And you can try to count these things. This is a good first attempt, but like many good first attempts, it's wrong. Um, so it doesn't work. And it, does, and it fails in a kind of spectacular way. Um, you can write down an example with two orbit sets where you know the chain map, this count has to be one. And yet there are no curves at all between the two generators. This is an infuriating example. But what there does exist is what's called a broken holomorphic curve. You have kind of two of these punctured curves stacked on top of each other. Uh, it passes through an intermediate orbit set. And that actually gives you the correct count of one. Okay. So somehow for these uh, chain maps, you have to count things that are not just a single curve, but maybe a stack of curves on top of each other. All right. And um, my recent work deals with determining which kinds of curves to count to give a well-defined chain map. Okay. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you.